Hello, everyone, and welcome to our show Voidcast. This is the sixth episode. I am your host for today, Lenny, and with me is my friend and co-host Carlos. Welcome and hello. Today we are going to discuss Solar Sands' video essay on voluntary extinction. But before we get into that, just a quick disclaimer: as usual, you are probably listening to us on YouTube, which is fine. So please keep listening. But you can also find us on Spotify as well as on other podcast platforms. So if you prefer these, check out our link tree at linktr.ee slash vegan voidcast. Links are in the description. And remember, our interview with John Williams from Antinatalist Advocacy is going to be released on the 15th of December. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, very excited about that one. Yeah, me too. All right. Um, we're going to discuss Solar Sands video. And this is another another request by Discord user Dude One, also known as Shujat Dar on YouTube, who, by the way, also suggested um, doing an episode on the Love, Death and Robots episode Pop Squad. So this is Voidcast number two. So we're very uh, open to suggestions, is what we're trying to say. So by all means, do email us. Uh, our email is on the link tree we advertised earlier. So you can email us through there. And, uh, you know, we'll, we're will we very open to feedback and to having like suggestions on things we, we, we can take on, like this video. Uh, this video, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, it discusses antinatalism, otherwise we will not be talking about it. But it's got a tremendous amount of views which is uh, sort of what attracted us to it. Yeah, it might actually be the most viewed video on antinatalism on YouTube. So if you um, search for antinatalism on YouTube and sort by popularity, this one should be the first or the second uh, result, actually. Um, it should be at about, last time I checked, 1,400,000 something views. So um, I assume quite a lot of people um, got introduced to antinatalism and antinatalist philosophy through this video, which is why I think, um, yeah, might be a good occasion to do a quick review and share our thoughts on the video. So uh, this video is um, 25 minutes long, so not particularly long, um, but it covers some of the most um, essential points, some of the key concepts, and uh, also has a bit of uh, criticism for antinatalism, which we're going to uh, review on this episode yeah i would say overall it's for a you know for a video of this popularity it's it's got quite a, a somewhat kind view of antinatalism i'm i'm happy that the the most viewed video on antinatalism is actually one that actually engages with the philosophy in you know in what i would say good faith yeah absolutely uh, so um antinatalist philosophy receives a very charitable treatment and uh, but the self-described antinatalist communities not so much as we will see all right so um what i appreciate about this video essay is um that it kind of um starts with presenting us with the idea of extinction and what do we mean by extinction when we think about the concept of extinction and this is what carlos and i uh, discussed on the last episode of voidcast we discussed the book by Emil Torres on human extinction. And as we've seen, it's an incredibly complex uh, topic and its discussion requires a lot of uh, a lot of nuance, a lot of um, consideration. So what do we mean by extinction? Do we mean a nuclear war? Do we mean some sort of cosmic event, some hostile alien civilization attacking mankind? No, this video focuses on nonviolent, peaceful, voluntary human extinction which is the focus of um, of this video. And then antinatalism is introduced and defined as the idea that procreation is morally wrong. I mean, this is a definition that has definitely seen some um, currency, both in literature and online. I'm not sure if it is a bit too narrow, because uh, usually um, you also require some sort of pessimistic evaluation that you base this uh, this normative claim on. So in my opinion, there's a bit more to antinatalism than what's given here, but definitely um, something we can work with. Yeah. Then, yeah. It's, 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 to me, it's a bit strange straight away. Uh, but as I said, it's a very char charitable view on antinatalism because the video is titled Voluntary Extinction, and then it goes into antinatalism. Mm -hmm. uh, so to me, this is sort of the path that um, uh, he, he never, uh, Solar Sands never really makes a claim on why voluntary extinction would by itself be a good thing, they immediately kind of jump into antinatalism straight away as a non-violent, 
a consensual path to voluntary extinction. Whereas um, maybe maybe the the reason is is because you know for the YouTube algorithm, just calling the video antinatalism would never have as many views as voluntary extinction would, right? Which are two terms mm-hmm. which most people know what they mean, whereas antinatalism they would not mean know what they mean. Yeah, exactly. But um, it's important to note that these concepts uh, of the link between these concepts, antinatalist philosophy and human extinction is uh, more complex than people uh, often mm, assume. So um, it's important like to, to distinguish between these two. And yeah. uh, what I really appreciate about this video, so uh, great job, is that he asks us, um, before getting into the topic itself, to leave any knee-jerk reactions at the door, because, of course, it's very easy uh, and very convenient to simply dismiss antinatalism on the basis that it on the basis that it seems absurd or counterintuitive or you know all these uh, maybe uh, strange associations that one might have with the term or with um, uh, the community or f- certain philosophers. So um, I think this shows that he is um, engaging in good faith, as you said, and um, has a very like unbiased unbiased view. And uh, he also points out that a certain uh, morbid fascination can can arise from this topic. And I think this is absolutely true. I mean, both um, as far as the philosophy is concerned, but also its history and the surrounding community. I mean, this is basically a, yeah, a, a very deep rabbit hole one can uh, dive into and basically how do you yeah, say explore yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean it's yeah yeah I, I would say i mean i would say that uh, i probably approached antinatalism from the same path that solar sands is approaching it where i thought it sounded so silly you know and yeah. and and then but something something must have resonated with me because i just kept uh going back to learn more about it i would say yeah, yeah for me for me it was similar um for me the fascination came before the agreement so to mm-hmm. speak. And honestly, I still find antinatalism and antinatalist philosophy more fascinating and interesting than I find the arguments themselves convincing, even though I would say I'm convinced by them. But uh, I think the, the interest and the fascination uh, outweighs. I would say I would I would generally agree with that. Solar Sands starts the discussion of antinatalism with a look on antinatalism at in, in broader culture and in its uh, historical context, which I think is uh, nice. And I think it's also important to point out that this is not just a like, brand new idea that some random guy from South Africa came up with. No, uh, this kind of thinking has been around for, uh, for ages, for centuries, for millennia, like since time immemorial. And uh, so there are a lot of these historical precedents, you could say, of antinatalism. However, I think it is extremely important, even though I'm a kind of a sucker for all these uh, ancient references, but it's extremely important um, for us that we don't try to retcon or establish some sort of retroactive continuity of supposedly antinatalist statements from uh, other cultures or other um, ages um, into our modern categories of philosophy and of, of thinking and because I noticed that uh, antinatalists and I think I'm t- guilty of that as well sometimes uh, are very prone to cherry picking like saying oh look this author or this historical figure it was one of us too and so this is to be approached with with a great deal of caution of course yeah and and for example the that bible quote to me yeah. that's not related to antinatalism at all uh it's i've seen it other antinatalists use it before matthew 26 24 mm-hmm. uh that's that's just poet, that's just poetic license to say you know this person did something so bad that this person should not have been born i mean people use this all the time even now mm-hmm. and it doesn't mean antinatalism at all it's not related to antinatalism at all it's it just means um you know this person did something so wrong that their punishment should should be never to have existed but it's not related to antinatalism as we know the the, the words these days yeah, you're right. And, or or, um, or for even, uh, you know, Freddie Mercury talking about uh, <laughs> I wish I had never been born at all in the song Lays Again. Yeah. This is just poetic license. It has nothing to do with uh, with antinatalism. We'll get to that in a bit. So first of all, like the topic of biblical antinatalism is extremely complex and um, difficult to, to assess too. Um, Solar Sands gives a few examples of supposedly antinatalist passages um, from the Old Testament as well as from the New Testament. And um, 
later on we also read this infamous be fruitful and uh, multiply uh, commandment but maybe antinatalists are familiar with this book by Théophile de Giraud called The Child-Free Christ, uh, which was also published in um, this History of Antinatalism collective volume and uh, in the Antinatalism magazine, which deals with um, Christianity uh, and antinatalism. So antinatalist thinking in early Christianity. And it's definitely a fascinating uh, read and uh, like a lot of intriguing ideas in there however it's important for us to remember that of course Théophile de Giraud um, is not a an expert on theology and I actually um, gave this book to one of my um, fellow students uh, of theology who is um, a Christian of course but also um, identifies strongly identifies with the child-free lifestyle and is also very sympathetic to to um, antinatalism and antinatalist ethics. So I gave this book to her and she wrote a very um, detailed response uh, to it. And there's certainly a lot to be criticized in these antinatalist layman's uh, interpretations of um, of Christianity. So a lot of literary context, um, like so social, uh, cultural context, historical context is required to make sense of these um, passages. And you can't just uh, like jump from passage to passage and, and simply cherry pick the ones that seem to agree most with your ideology. So we need to be careful with that. And um, if you're interested, I hosted um, a conference on Judeo-Christian antinatalism, where we also discuss like um, antinatalism in the Bible uh, with uh, my friend and uh, yeah, famous antinatalist philosopher Karim Akerma in August uh, 2022 at my university and video recordings of this uh, of this conference of this um, guest lecture are now available on YouTube as well with English subtitles and lots of um, useful material in the description. So you're going to find that in our video description as well. So this was uh, um, like a brief section on on biblical. Antinatalism, but he also gives um, another uh, example of Greek literature of Sophocles. Um, uh, this famous uh, uh, famous saying that uh, it is better never uh, to have come into existence. And I'm actually uh, planning to write my MA uh, thesis on um, Greek pessimism and uh, supposedly antinatalist uh, thoughts in Greek literature. So you can also stay tuned for that. And yes, uh, Carlos already pointed out that uh, sometimes we see traces of antinatalist or supposedly antinatalist thinking in um, popular culture. And an example that Solar Sands gives is of um, Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody, where it says, Mama, oh, I don't want to die. Sometimes I wish I'd never been born at all. And interestingly, the same um, song is also mentioned and uh, referenced in Karima Kermer's uh, uh, handbook on, on antinatalism, but I think only in the German version. But nevertheless, I think it's an, an interesting, certainly an interesting um, uh, expression to find in, in music as well, even though it has, as you said, probably very little to do with um, antinatalist philosophy itself. So it's not like we can derive some sort of normative claim from this. Uh, yeah, um, and uh, it's an expression people use yeah. all the time. People yeah. will use it, you know, when things are not going their way, they will say, I wish mm. I'd never been born at all. But yeah, so it's um, even though this is kind of in, in certain ways seems to point towards an, an antinatalist sentiment, it's, it's important for us to, to also um, acknowledge the context in which these expressions are made. And this also goes, of course, for the famous lamentations in, in the Old Testament, for example. So, yeah, then uh, he um, says, well, there are a couple of um, groups today that also see procreation as a negative. And this is where he briefly mentions uh, uh, vehement. So the voluntary human extinction movement, um, as well as uh, the Christian community of the Shakers, which I think is nearly extinct now. Only, I think, less than 10 members uh, are left. And yep. he also he also uh, mentioned the kind of the opposite <laughs> uh, of, of this, um, the quiverful movement which is basically um like a group of christians trying to have as many children uh, as possible and i've never heard of these before honestly i know I, that I, unfortunately i had <laughs> okay 
Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it, there's not much to it besides what you'd expect it to be. It's very much on the face, you know. Uh, um, mm -hmm. You know, there's there are souls to be there are souls to come into the world, uh, waiting to come into the world. So you need to have as many children as possible, so those souls can come into the world and find salvation. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned this souls waiting to come into the world because I don't think this is a an originally. I think Christian it's. Uh, I think it comes from Mormonism, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, in in Judaism, there's also such a thing as the so-called goof space. Uh, so a very ancient natal myth that uh, souls are yearning to be brought into this world and uh, are kind of suffering from their non-existence. It's a, it's a very bizarre thought. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it goes really well with trying to expand your religion, doesn't it? Especially in our day and age. Um, memes that is not uh, these uh, funny images but uh, the ideas uh, cultural yeah. phenomenon uh, yeah exactly memes and ideas are probably stronger than than genes so uh, i don't yeah. i would, wouldn't put too much uh, f faith in that yeah well i've i've heard from dozens of vegans yeah, say exactly. that uh, say that they uh, should uh, vegans should have as many children as possible so there's more vegans than non-vegans yeah. in the world and build a vegan army to yeah exactly yeah <laughs> the okay so i mean uh, so just, just, just to say it's not it's not even the met you don't need the metaphysics to to subscribe to this kind of uh, attitude towards procreation yeah yeah absolutely but of course, this is in stark contrast with uh, what antinatalists uh, want and, and value. So then he goes on to discuss the philosophy of David Benetton. And most of the arguments um, that he discusses in this video are taken from Benetton's book, Better Never to Have Been, The Harms of Coming into Existence. So essentially uh, required reading for antinatalists. And just by having read this book i think he he's already doing a better job than the majority of of uh, online antinatalists yeah i mean he does treat panatar fairly well i would say yeah yeah i mean it's it's very easy to simply dismiss him dismiss his arguments and he also said well Benatar's kind of a mysterious figure rarely giving personal details about his life especially whether he has children or not but this is actually one of the few like confirmed um, pieces of information that you can find on on Benita. He actually confirmed this in uh, in a few interviews. Yeah, he... uh, but I would say that this obsession with the 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 kind of the figurehead, uh, you know, the, or the 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 person who represents the idea, mm -hmm. uh, is is a very YouTube thing as well. And I think a reflection yeah. of the age we live in, where everybody kind of knows everything about everybody. Well, everybody mm -hmm. that's in the public space. For example, I mean, I went through some of the comments on YouTube, which I know we should never do, but I thought it was important. And mm -hmm. there were people there dismissing Benatar because uh, it was, um, oh, well, if he's willing to put out these ideas, he should, you should, you know, let his uh, life be scrutinized to see if he's consistent, you know, if he mm -hmm. really does live as somebody who thinks there's more harm than good in life, you know, if he yeah. really does not have children, if he really um, lives or has an, a life that, has more pains and discomforts than uh, pleasure, right? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, to me, this uh, uh, to me, it's not important. And I, I know this also happens in within the antinatalist community itself, where people are very quick to dismiss others for um, you know their past or what they do or what they haven't done, uh, if they're vegan, not vegan, etc. Uh, but it also happens in the vegan community. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the very famous example, right? Uh, Peter Singer, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, but as Benita says, and I think rightly says, he says, I don't think that my arguments should rest on whether I am a hypocrite or not. That is, in this case, whether he has children or not. And I, I fully agree with that. Yeah, me too. So, um, yeah, Solar Sands says or claims that antinatalism is one simple idea and that it simply means anti-procreation. And I'm not sure if I would agree with that statement. So I, th I think anti-procreation is definitely... Um, an important part of antinatalism, but these ideas are not synonymous. So you can, not all forms of opposition to um, procreation are necessarily uh, antinatalist uh, in nature. And as I said, there's more to, to antinatalism, this whole pessimism thing attached to it and so forth. But um, for the purposes of this, this video, I think it's... Um, it's uh, enough, yeah. It's enough, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so what I appreciate about this video is that he, like right off the bat, says... Antinatalism is not about taking away people's legal rights to um, uh, reproduction, people's reproductive rights. 
it's not about um, forcibly sterilizing the world, and uh, it's uh, it also ha allows for a nuanced discussion of of abortion, and uh, so these are very important distinctions, and uh, even in not only from when, when people who are new to antinatalism or are against antinatalism um, bring these up, but even among antinatalists, uh, there's all, often a, a debate around these subjects, but I think it's very important to say no, antinatalism is not about these um, things in, in, in particular. Yeah, and, and also distinguishes it from being a, a, a pro-mortalist as well. Exactly. Which exactly. is very important. Um, I fully agree. and uh, But he uses it in a slightly different context. Um, he uses... Uh, from mortalism in the context of abortion, like saying you, you must you must kill the child, and but Benita actually uses this term only once in Better Never to Have Been, um, when he's talking about um, hypothetical human killing extinction. Um, antinatalism only um, implies some sort of dying extinction, but he says were antinatalists to become pro mortalists and embark on a speciesite program of killing humans, their actions would be plagued by moral problems that would not be faced by dying extinction. So David Benatar is, um, of course, a very strong proponent of antinatalism, but um, strongly rejects promortalism and also denies that his arguments, especially the asymmetry that we're going to talk about next, um, implies some sort of promortalism. So... I think these are one of one of the things he's most um, like. He puts a lot of weight on on this distinction. So yeah, yeah. then um, he uh, of course discusses uh, the axiological asymmetry. Um, so the, the first part of Benedict's uh, argument for antinatalism, and I still remember when I first came across the Wikipedia page for antinatalism many years ago, and I must have been in my late teens i think and i saw this uh, like this diagram and i remember how ridiculous i found it when i first saw it like like this is not how you do philosophy <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um i mean now after having read all um of these books and engaged with the discourse and so forth i think there's there's definitely some truth to it but um i understand that this um yeah, Solar Sands calls it robotic way, this uh, strongly reductionistic way of um, approaching very complex issues uh, in life um, are probably not appealing to to a lot of people. And well, I think... it's, yeah, he's it's, it's right, though. He's it's, it's completely right. I mean, it's uh, it's really hard to explain. I know there's uh, quite a lot of people doing, uh, well, antinatalist outreach, I would say. Mm -hmm. And uh, I cannot imagine trying to explain that to somebody to convince them not to have children. Imagine uh, seeing this diagram. <laughs> yeah, well, let me let me get this diagram out of the pocket of my pocket, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm immediately convinced upon upon seeing this. No, I think it is a fascinating piece of analytic philosophy, but at the end of the day, it's it's a technicality of sorts, and um, probably if you want to derive any sort of normative uh, claim from your assessment, um, you need to further qualify it, of course. And this is what Benatar does and what um, Solar Sands also um, um, discusses, the quality of life argument, so the the other part of, of Benatar's argument. And in his book, Benatar gives a very exhaustive list of uh, the frequent discomforts and pains that we face, um, which I'm going to read out now. So he says, negative mental states include discomfort, pain, suffering, distress, guilt, shame, irritation, boredom, anxiety, frustration, stress, fear, grief, sadness, and loneliness. And then he proceeds, conditions causing negative mental states include hunger, thirst, bowel and bladder distension as these organs become filled, tiredness, stress, thermal discomfort, that is feeling either too hot or too cold, and itch. <laughs> and on he goes. Discomforts, pain, and suffering that are experienced either less frequently or only by some, though nonetheless very many people, include allergies, headaches, frustration, irritation, colds, menstrual pains, hot flushes, nausea, hypoglycemia, seizures, guilt, mm -hmm. shame, boredom, sadness, depression, loneliness, body image dissatisfaction, the ravages of AIDS, of cancer, and of other such life-threatening diseases, and grief, 
and bereavement. And I think Cabrera summed it up pretty well. It is hard at this point to do better than Benita in the exhaustive listing of our daily calamities. <laughs> And I think it's quite an impressive, uh, impressive list because we tend to forget like how much of our life is actually characterized by one or more of these states. Yes, and uh, it, it could not be otherwise. I mean, it, yeah, it, it, we we exist, we we exist as such beings because of evolutionary reasons, because we must be kept in motion uh, yeah. to constantly be unsatisfied or only be satisfied for very brief periods of time. So we always, you know either too hungry or too full or, um, you know, either one or the other, we can never really be at rest. Yeah. We are designed to be hungry and horny, not happy. Yes, exactly. I mean, otherwise I think the species, I mean, otherwise we'd be like what pandas and just die out <laughs> without the <laughs> assistance of a, of a higher species. Yeah, I wouldn't object to that. <laughs> so, um, then he discusses the Pollyanna, um, principle that is, um, the psychological mechanisms by which we constantly deceive ourselves and uh, like constantly overestimate the quality of our lives. And uh, I mean, this is certainly something that can be um, criticized. And you could argue that um, these Pollyanna mechanisms are actually good, good yep. for us. And uh, as, for example, uh, Professor Hauskeller has, does, has done in his uh, defense of cheery optimism, for example, so it's one possible response to antinatalism, which uh, Solar Sands also um, also mentions. Yeah, um, in, 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 in that sense, what's actually real has no bearing on the argument for antinatalism. Because does it really matter if our lives are bad, if the, if the people living it actually consider it good? I think this is a very... Complex. Uh, it is. Complex yeah. Person. I mean, I'll give you another example. I mean, study after study will say that will show you that, for example, people uh, in prison have the same level of satisfaction with lives with people who are outside prison. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, just through, just through uh, adaptation and our brains trying to, trying to keep us going effectively, right? Yeah. Um, also, uh, Andreas Mus did an excellent video in defense of. Um, depressive realism, which is a, a different concept, uh, to be clear, but the mechanisms are similar. And uh, so people who at one point have had a terrible um, accident and are left disabled, eventually reach um, after like after a few months or after a few years, um, reach the same level of, uh, of happiness and sometimes even a higher level of happiness than people who did not suffer such a misfortune. So... Yeah, indeed, a uh, very uh, like fascinating, fascinating concept. Then at one point, Solar Sands says billions of animals must must be farmed and killed to feed our populations. What do you make of that, Carlos? Well, <laughs> they don't have to, but the fact is, uh, you know, our existence requires a lot of suffering of other animals, no matter how well we try to live. I think, well, we, we know this. I mean, I think every vegan knows this. Uh, in deep inside themselves, they. They either know this or uh, try to avoid thinking about it, but it's true. Um, yes, but I would also like to add that we could feed many more people if everyone um, went on a plant-based diet. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, I mean, if if the the whole of humanity, all eight billion of us, went vegan overnight, we would not have to kill billions of animals. Uh, yeah. We'd we we'd still need to keep. I mean, we couldn't return all the all the land we've taken for food production back to. We cannot we cannot uh, turn that turn that land back to its wild state and make uh, perfectly balanced ecosystems, but the difference would be, of course, massive. I mean, it's yeah. still worth doing. I mean, it, this is one of those argument uh, the Nirvana fallacy, I think it's called, where if you say, well, if you can't make it perfect, then there's no point in doing it. Well, we can't make it perfect, but we can certainly make it a lot better. Um, this I think um, also becomes relevant um, with, when we discuss like what the actual aims. Of antinatalism and uh, and its its application. Uh, then he also um, uh, brings up Benito's term of the procreational Ponzi scheme, which is a, ter a term that I really like, um, which is not in better never to have been, but in uh, in debating procreation and the human predicament. So it only comes up in later uh, in his later publications. But nonetheless, I think it's a very um, like a very catchy image. 
yeah, where f- future gen- uh, future generations need to be created in order to support the generations that came before, and then those generations need to create their own children to be supported themselves when they grow too old to to care for themselves effectively or produce food for themselves, food and, and not, shelter, etc. And not just in terms of like uh, um, care for for the elderly and support of the social system, but also as a source to derive meaning from. Mm-hmm. And and kind of family and attachments and yeah. um, you know all those kinds of um, kind of essentials of life or so what's up, I mean we all kind of create families in our own way even us who who do not procreate um, with groups but you know people need other people right and the easiest way to getting other people well not the easiest but a surefire way of getting other people who are likely to like you and love you is by creating them yeah and speaking of people forming groups out of desperation he discusses the reddit community r slash antinatalism and he says there are also groups that have taken antinatalism in a much more unsavory but ultimately predictable direction and uh, like he takes a look at this forum uh, the subreddit and says there's a lot of unhinged rants and most of the community seems to be more interested in complaining and self-pity rather than discussing the philosophy. And I think his analysis is absolutely spot on. Look, look, he's right, okay? But I will still defend using the term breathers. Okay, I, I think this is something that we probably disagree on. I like, like this th- term. I, w- I, will, I will keep using it. Solar Sands is against it, and he points out in uh, the subreddit that people use it in a derogatory way. I will keep using it. Perhaps the, the B word. Maybe we'll change it just to the B word. <laughs> <laughs> and then I called him the B word. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we must also keep in mind that this video was published, I think, in uh, early uh, 2021. Mm-hmm. And at that time, the internationalist subreddit had um, only 100,000 members at that time. And uh, now it has uh, more than doubled. And the quality has not gone up since. So uh, it's only gotten worse. And uh, But I think it is important that we have some sort of like consensus among us that we don't like this subreddit and that we don't feel represented by what's going on there. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, th- I mean, there's people who come there, who, who get there and and are posting good stuff, but they get drowned yeah. out by by the upvotes on the on the rant. Effectively. Yeah, and of these, how many members are there now? I think more, way more than two hundred thousand. Um, there's really only a handful of um quality contributors quality posters yeah and of, of course have... they, they get drowned out eventually right and yeah yeah so they had to look for other um, communities elsewhere yeah but i think what is important is that he um uh, distinguishes between the philosophy itself and whatever people on the internet uh, make of it so this is an extremely important distinction it's so easy to dismiss antinatalism not only on the basis of how unintuitive um it's uh, uh, conclusions are but um also on the basis of how self-described antinatalists on the internet behave and i think um it's definitely good to see that people see through this and uh, make this distinction yeah because effectively i mean it's not like you it's not like for example uh, a political party or political ideas where there are institutions that Mm -hmm. represent those ideas and and have i don't know governance and then can act in a consistent way with those ideas. Uh, antinatalism, for better or worse, and I think worse in this case, mm-hmm. is for the most part represented by individuals on social media and on internet forums like Reddit. Um, so given that, it's it's charitable that Solar Sands looks at the sources rather than at the behavior. Yeah, which is something that not only like anti-antinatalists should do, but also antinatalists themselves. Like, shouldn't... I would recommend not having your ethical views informed by what random people on the internet say. Yeah, I mean, there, there's no Vatican for antinatalism to say what Christ- Catholicism is and isn't in that sense. Yeah, it's a philosophy. It's not a, a dogmatic um, exactly. ideology. Yeah. Yeah. Very important to keep in mind. And with, with no institutions, effectively. Yeah, but th- this is very important because I sometimes because there are definitely strong. Um, like these dogmatic tendencies in online antinatalism, and uh, it's important to to call these out, I think. So then uh, SolarSense uh, proceeds to um, present a couple of bad arguments, both for and against antinatalism. I think this is a very interesting section. And um, for 
a couple of seconds, only for two or three seconds, um, he shows a post on the subreddit Unpopular Opinion, which reads, if you're not capable of providing for your children their whole lives, then you shouldn't have them. And, oh, I'm, uh, I'm so glad you picked that up because I made a note of that one too. <laughs> yeah, I did too. <laughs> so um, Solar Sands um, also shows us, briefly shows us his own um, answer or his own counter. He says, while one can plan and prepare resources for a child, tragedy can can strike unexpectedly, and it's impossible to look into the future and be assured your child's whole life will be, will be provided for. This is essentially a less effective way of approaching a different antinatalist argument. What do you have to say about that, Carlos? If you're not capable of providing for your children their whole lives, then you shouldn't have have them. And since you cannot plan for accidents and so forth, you shouldn't have them. Great, you're creating you're creating a problem in the water. Uh, the metaphor that's usually used is uh, with a hole, right? You you dug the hole and now you have to fill the hole. And if you don't think you'll be able to fill the hole, and nobody can because life is full of things we mm -hmm. cannot predict, then you shouldn't dig the hole. Yeah, I think you're taking a risk here. And if there's absolutely no re no need to take that risk, then you shouldn't take it in the first place. Yes, but I, it's, I think. It's, 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 so Solar yes. Sand says it's a ridiculous argument, but I think it's a good argument. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not... The, the phrasing is not great, yeah. No, 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 because it would also imply that people who are indeed capable of providing for their children do nothing wrong by procreating. Yeah. So it's, it's not technically not an antinatalist argument. But um, what is interesting is that um, certain antinatalist uh, philosophers and writers like uh, Théophile de Giraud and Karima Kerma have actually argued um, for a right to sue one's parents for um, for recompensation, basically. And Karima Kerma, um, in his uh, wonderful antinatalist handbook, also there's an entry uh, called Existence Allowance for an Unconditional Nativistic Basic Income. That is, um, He argues that by being brought into existence, and like you, um, you, you, you didn't get a chance to say no to your creation. Of course not. Um, but you should at least have the option not to say yes to everything that uh, life has in store for you. And um, so you should not be punished for for existing. Um, and I think this is um, indeed an important, very important thing. Like I'm absolutely in favor of some sort of basic uh, basic income. Um, especially like since no one really chose to come here in the first place. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I agree. Uh, of course, more than that, but uh, I'll I would, uh, you know, Nirvana fallacy and all. You know, I'll settle for that, <laughs> which is very unlikely since you know uh, we we bring we being brought here for a reason. So although, uh, although as somebody you know somebody like Cabrera would say that uh, the main reason one of the main reasons we're brought into this world is just because our parents want want a doll to play with. Some mini me, <laughs> mini me, and to dress in the clothes they like, and to like the same football club they like, and uh, follow on the dreams that they never managed to follow. You know, so it's like you know ha having a little automaton that can yeah. do what you want. So in some ways, you you're being kind of sorely kidnapped by your parents to do their bidding, as a child at least. Mm. There are lots of uh, projection and, and manipulation going on yeah. there, of course. So um, then he also <laughs> um, presents a couple of uh, terrible arguments against antinatalism like these uh, trite statements like oh life is a gift and uh, live love love and so forth and uh, he also i mean this is something that i appreciate he um he defends antinatalism against uh, these uh, accusations of for example demanding forced uh, sterilizations but also um against this uh, very common uh, question that we are asked why don't you just kill yourself might be the most might actually be the most uh common reaction to antinatalism online yeah he, and, he, i mean he offers the good argument against that you know the pain of yeah. death the, our survival instinct and and the fact that you know uh, once we're born we have our own interests of survival and our own in interests in life which yeah. we don't have as unborn and uh, yeah he points out that wishing to die and wishing to never have been born are two very separate things and um i think uh I don't know what uh, your view on death is, but I do think that Benatar's arguments for the badness of death, that is not only coming into existence as a harm, but death is also a very uh, serious harm, I think are, uh, are quite uh, um, quite important in, in the discourse as well. Yes, especially because a lot of uh, online antinatalists or people who call themselves antinatalists consider the two things to be the same. Yeah, And when we've uh, often have seen the argument that, uh, you know, Okay, I'm an antinatalist. Life is really bad. And so if I kill somebody, I'd be doing them a favor. 
yeah, this is of course an extremely dangerous uh, like uh, uh, way of thinking. Yeah, and uh, not something that uh, antinatalism should be associated with. Yeah, he also mentioned something. Solar Sands mentioned something which is often forgotten. You know, the fact that uh, when you uh, you know, religious people, uh, if they're from a religion that believes in heaven and hell, you know, every time you bring a child into the world, that child is literally, according to their logic and their uh, um, religion, you know, running the risk of eternal damnation. You know, that's that's eternal suffering. It's not just for 80 years while you're in this planet, but it's, you know, forever. Yeah. Uh, and, and, so, and, and who would want to inflict that on a baby or on a child? Yeah. So while I think it is important to acknowledge that, um, Antinatalism, like contemporary modern antinatalism, um, is a secular um, position, secular philosophy. But nonetheless, it is also compatible with, um, not with all, but with certain religious beliefs. And I think that the concept of hell and eternal suffering, um, if you believe in that, then this should is a very good reason against um, against having children. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's what uh, a, a, an argument to leave to uh, our antinatalist colleagues doing outreach. Yeah, if they who find must, the right uh, the, the right target for that one, who must be prepared to um, uh, confront a lot of religious people. Of course, um, I think who was it? John uh, of antinatalist advocacy had this um, debate with uh, a couple of um, Muslim Muslims, for example. And I mean, you, you would have to be very well prepared and. Uh, very familiar with their beliefs and literature and um, doctrine uh, in order to to make a case for antinatalism there. So, um, yeah, very, Absolutely. very complex, complex topic, of course. So um, then he um, also offers some arguments he considers uh, sound, some, some stronger arguments against antinatalism. And just to be clear, there are a lot of uh, good arguments against antinatalism too. So it's not... <laughs> like the arguments that we uh, often um, promote or um, share and discuss, they're not they're not bulletproof. And what I think is important um, that we must also be ready to say, well, okay, maybe there um, there can be criticism of these, and maybe um, this argument or that argument is not so strong after all, and uh, are on the side of caution. And the thing is that. If it turns out that uh, antinatalists were wrong the whole time, I think um, the damage they do by simply not bringing new life into existence is pretty small. I mean, no, no one is actually harmed by that. You can't be harmed if you, you don't exist. Um, but once you try to um, attach antinatalism to some sort of positive duty, like some sort of interventions, and then it becomes much more problematic, and then uh, you better make sure that your reasoning is bulletproof. Yeah. Uh, although at the end, towards the end of the video, his conclusion is that, uh, well, we'll get to that when we get to that. But I, I, I have to agree. Yeah. He. Uh, I mean, even, the... even, even breathers, sorry, uh, are not constantly making babies, are they? You know, they, yeah. they, they, they engage more in not making babies or not bringing babies into the world that they engage in the bringing of babies to the world. Yeah. And in any case, even if we um, suppose for a moment that pronatalism is uh, the right position after all, or the superior moral position, then I don't think that uh, failure to produce a new being could be uh, equated with um, uh, failure to let a being live like a living being uh, yeah. continue to exist. So these are extremely important uh, distinction. So, okay. so uh, Solar Sands then presents his own counter argument, which uh, I found quite interesting. So he says the lifetime of the universe, even the lifetime of Earth, extends in front of us for billions of years. If we did fully adopt antinatalism and went extinct, intelligent life could evolve again. This means that that intelligent life would likely go through a similar history of civilization, development, and conflict, creating a similar amount of suffering. In this sense, making ourselves go extinct simply delays the inevitable, and antinatalism would actually generate more suffering by essentially restarting the process from square one. If we continued to exist and progress, and progress, uh, we would have all the developments and technology that we could share with this new intelligent life, lessening any further suffering of that species. If we continue to exist and progress, we would have all the developments and technology 
that we would share with this that we could share with this new intelligent life, lessening any further suffering of that species. This argument is also very optimistic. It makes a lot of assumptions and predictions for the future. But I would say it's still a counterpoint that could be considered. Now, uh, I've seen this um, argument quite a number of times on, on the internet. And I don't know people think they're very original when they make this point. But um, this was actually one of the objections of pessimist philosopher Eduard von Hartmann in the 19th century, who we also discussed in, in our um, last episode. So he is... Um, <laughs> he was kind of the the original, the OG uh, long termist. <laughs> no, no, not long termist, but um, button presser. So he was um, strongly in favor of um, like uh, of extinction, but uh, against antinatalism as a means to reach that to reach that goal. Yes, I, you... I meant long termism as in as in we we need to kind of keep keep going until we could find the the kill mechanism that would extinguish ah, yeah. us without uh, without all the suffering and so forth. Yeah, kind yeah. of kind of the, the pessimist uh, the pessimist long termist yeah. yeah exactly so he said he wrote what would it avail for example if all mankind should die out gradually by sexual continence the world as such would still continue to exist and would find itself substantially in the same position as immediately before the origin of the first man nay the unconscious would even be compelled to employ the next opportunity to fashion a new man uh, or a similar type and the whole misery would begin over again so this was his objection to um, antinatalism yeah. and to not procreating. And um, I think it's an interesting argument, but it is not an argument against antinatalism per se. It's an argument against claiming that antinatalism can solve the problem of suffering and so, you know, solve all the suffering in the world. Yeah. And also, I, I don't think I, I honestly don't trust humanity to come across an intelligent life, uh, a life mm. with of in, intel, enough in, intelligence to match ours. I I do not think it will go down. It will go well for this emerging intelligent life. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think th what is important is that we must recognize that this is like far beyond the scope of antinatalism itself. Antinatalism is only concerned with coming into existence and bringing into existence, but not with preventing sentience from ever rising again. So this is uh, something far beyond the scope also of uh, of the arguments that we we're dealing with. Yeah, and and it's but it's also because this video never clearly establishes i mean solar sand should watch our episode number five uh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to establish the difference between you know kind of extinction and antinatalism mm -hmm. it's two separate things um yeah. you know for example uh you know cabrera and this is my translation apology he, when he talks about negative ethics he says a negative ethics survival not even our own survival as individuals nor of groups nor of the human species have value as a moral demand this means that, that if moral reasons determine we should disappear, then to disappear is what we ethically and politically should do. Therefore, in ethic, negative ethics, arguments like antinatalism must be wrong because if taken to its conclusion, it will lead to extinction, do not work. And to me, you know, that's it. You know, uh, antinatalism and voluntary extinctions are are two two separate things. And and, yeah. and 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 one can be used as a mechanism for the other or one can be used as justification for the other. But... Mm -hmm. But they exist uh, separately, and and Solar Sands' argument is purely an argument about extinction, not yeah. an argument about uh, uh, you know the ethics of procreation. And in addition to that, this idea that humans have a duty to stay around to find a solution to the problem of suffering is certainly something that you sometimes hear from uh, negative utilitarians, for example. But in this case, the negative utilitarian thinking kind of overrides the antinatalism. So. Um, yeah, it's it's not an an argument against uh, what is brought forward by Benatar, Cabrera, Kalimakama, and others. So, yeah, I mean, even even voluntary extinction could happen without antinatalism, right? Unfortunately, you know, like a, yeah. some sort of a, a communal suicide pact. Yeah, yeah, um, which would be... something completely different, right, from uh, from and an antinatalism. Which is what um, Taurus would classify as pro-mortalist, pro-extinction. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So these are the the arguments for and against antinatalism, and then um, Solar Sense also discusses um, the a couple of problems um, in population ethics that are addressed in Benatar's book, which I find uh, really interesting. So, in um, the book by Taurus on human extinctions, they also kind of give an outline of 
the discourse in in the 20th century on population ethics and the paradoxes and problems and asymmetries that um, arise in, in population ethics. And maybe this is one of the reasons why um, Better Never to Have Been uh, was such a such a breakthrough because it, uh, it <laughs> Benetton doesn't simply present a theory of everything, but he uh, actively engages with um, the discourse and offers solutions to like non-identity problem, this mere addition paradox, and so forth. So definitely one of the strengths uh, of his of his book. Okay, then uh, Solstens makes some big statements. Uh, he says uh, antinatalism is logically logistically absurd. Because don't, the arguments don't matter, as it will never happen. And I think well, he's correct. <laughs> I mean, he's he's correct. It doesn't mean that antinatalism doesn't have any value. Uh, it, one yeah. thing is one thing is irrelevant to the other, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as I from that quote from that Cabrera quote, you know, if, if it's morally correct, it's morally correct. It doesn't matter if it's logistically absurd or not. He also says that he sees antinatalism as being just like an extreme version of being devil's advocate, not a serious ideology. Well, well he, he contrasts ideology with philosophy in this context yeah yeah and, and says um well um antinatalism is never going to appeal to the masses which is some, a statement that i agree with and uh of course one day mankind will go extinct but i think antinatalists will have uh very little uh very little part in that i mean and, and it's not it's not like there'll be antinatalists around to celebrate yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> We won. Yeah. We won. Yes. The, the asteroid we, is we coming. We are extinct now. We are yeah. extinct now. Let's celebrate. Yeah, maybe the artificial intelligence that are left can celebrate. Yeah. The antinatalists' artificial intelligence. You know who will celebrate? The transhumanists. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Once, one... <laughs> this Darwinian malware of Homo sapiens is extinct. And now we have our blissful lives. The, and... the, 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 the void cast AI that's built of our two uh, twin consciousnesses in the same mainframe or something. We'll celebrate. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, he says antinatalism is more useful as a philosophy than as a serious ideology. And uh, so he says it, it is useful in the sense that it raises a lot of uh, very important questions and like also attempts to to provide answers to these and kind of the, the merits of antinatalism are more in its uh, theory than in its uh, practical application which i think is uh, is great fair enough so, uh, yeah i agree and uh, to me to be honest i think uh, in philosophy in general um, like this questioning and, and raising questions is uh, more important even than providing answers and uh, this is what makes the whole discussion and the whole discourse so fascinating. And I noticed that a lot of people desperately try to find answers, um, like almost uh, as in a religion, for example. And I don't think this is the right approach uh, one should take to uh, a philosophy, especially not a philosophy as logistically absurd as ours. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I've... I guide my life by it, but I I was already already made I had already made the decision before even coming across antinatalism. So um, yeah, when you say you guide your life by it, um, of course we have to recognize that the scope of antinatalism is very limited. Yeah, I mean that that part of my life, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, although 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 then kind of uh, more broadly the pessimistic philosophy would yeah of course pessimism I think it has a much, much broader much yeah. broader scope yeah and uh, veganism too of course. And uh, yeah, do you think um, this video of Solar Sands is um, an accurate representation of um, uh, antinatalism and of better never to have been? It's a fair representation. And I, I would yeah. say if I'm introducing the concept to somebody who's not, let's say, philosophically minded, I might recommend that as it moves at a very quick pace. It covers a lot of ground. It does get a bit bogged down on the utilitarian uh, utilitarianism. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like the mere addiction, addiction paradox is not something that um, the, the normal person would be too concerned about. Um, <laughs> I no, I mean, with, <laughs> yeah, we, we, with the graphs and everything. I mean, I, I yeah. thought that that went, that went a bit too overboard because uh, antinatalism can, can be just explained using language. You know, you don't mm -hmm. need, um, you know, at this level, you don't need to get into the asymmetry. You don't need to get into the utilitarian uh, problems. Um, so maybe that's not fantastic. But I would recommend it to somebody who never thinks about these these things, or 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 ethics in general, perhaps not even yeah. thinks about ethics. I mean, everybody thinks about ethics because everybody likes to think they're doing the right thing. 
um, or if they or if they know they're not doing the right thing, they're not acting morally. They like to create reasons for that, or justifications, or loopholes. So most people do think about ethics, but not in these terms. So I would mm -hmm. say for that kind of audience, yes. And also uh, at the end, when Solar Sands uh, talks about the merits of AN and says um, antinatalism as a way to ask important questions for future parents, that to me would be a good target audience for this. If, yes, if, if I knew some, like a, a couple and they're thinking of having kids or a single person who's thinking of having kids, biological kids, I would say, all right, all right. Uh, what quality, what quality of life do I do you expect your child to have? Will you be adequately be able to provide? Will be able to give love and care if they don't grow up to be the person you expect them to be? Which is a very good question that Solar Sands asks. Uh, does this child need to be a biological offspring? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, how how will I react? You or how will the prospective biological parent react if the child decides that their life is too painful to continue? You know, these yeah. it raises all these questions, which I think to me makes the future biological parents a good target audience for me to share this video. However, if you're a prospective parent and you just see the title and maybe the thumbnail, um, Voluntary Extinction, you probably don't think that this is going to be about uh, like rethinking your procreative choices, right? Mm -hmm. Do, do, do so, you think it's, it's, it's a bait and switch? Yeah, I mean, um, due to the uh, confusion of these two concepts, extinction and antinatalism, I mean, um, it's not it's not uh, quite clear what this uh, video is going to be about if you just read the title. True, true. So um, also important to mention it uh, is that this focuses um, primarily on uh, Benita's arguments for antinatalism. But as we've seen, there are also different approaches one can take to antinatalism. We, uh, in this episode, we often mentioned uh, Julio Cabrera, but there are also like, people like uh, Karima Kerma for example, also definitely worth um, checking out. So I think this should be uh, made clear that this is just one possible approach one can take. Maybe the, the one that is most discussed online and in um, uh, and in academia too, but nevertheless, uh, other approaches are also possible and um, worth um, uh, studying. Certainly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that was Voluntary Extinction by Solar Sands. Uh, we hope you like this episode and, um, well, stay tuned for our interview and uh, conversation with the Antinatalist Advocacy coming in the middle of December and for episode seven. Yeah. So take care and uh, see you in the new year. Bye-bye.